Okay, check, 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 check. Eva Rechacha Adonai, the Yishmerecha. Okay, and did you mute me? Okay, I'm not muted. I am on a hot mic. Oh, you must be on the blue channel. Hello. Hello. Then the man stepped right up to the microphone.
Good morning, I'm Reverend Joanna. Welcome home. Unitarian Universalism is unambiguously, unapologetically progressive. This church affirms the inherent worth and dignity of all people through anti-racism, anti-oppression, supporting the LGBTQIA community, working for reproductive justice, voting rights, and other issues as needed. And right now, every single morning, doesn't it feel like there's another issue as needed? We seek to build beloved community, not only here, but also in our surrounding area. And we bring a spirit of joy to it all. It is so good to be together on this beautiful morning. Would you please rise, either in body or in spirit, for our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken. has broken like the first morning blackbird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them springing fresh from the Sweet is the new fall, sunlit from heaven, like the first dew fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the wet garden, sprung in completeness where God's feet pass. Is the sunlight, mine is the morning, born of the one light, Eden soft lay. Praise with elation, praise every morning, God's recreation. Welcome to Live Oak Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Mark Anderson, and one thing I love about Live Oak is the opportunity to fellowship with other UUs on a men's retreat weekend at UBAR U Camp and Retreat Center. Our next men's retreat is coming up in two weeks, and I'd love to talk with anyone interested after our service today, maybe see some familiar faces out there in a couple of weeks. I'd also like to welcome any guests we have today. If this is your first time here, please stop by the visitor's table so we can meet you and answer any questions you might have. As part of our mission, we want to enhance the connections between each of us and also with the outside world. You can stay connected with everything happening at Live Oak through our weekly email newsletter. There's a link on our homepage. And during this worship service, no need to put away your phone. We encourage you to post on social media things you hear today, maybe even an invitation for a friend to join you next week. Today, our chalice is being lit by Wren Goss. And now, here and at home, let us light our chalices with these words. Our chalice is a reminder that in hard times, our ancestors in faith acted with courage to bring hope and safety, to bring life itself to threatened people. We light it this morning as a reminder of who we are called to be in a world which is often dangerous and despairing. With courage and faith, we bring ourselves to the work before us. This is a congregation bound not by creed, but by covenant. May those in agreement affirm this covenant now. We affirm a caring community of and for all ages, seeking wisdom, 
doing service, and living with integrity. In our diversity, our covenant holds us in unity as we celebrate our shared spiritual journey. A special part of Unitarian Universalist Sunday services is our time of sharing joys and sorrows. I think of it as the time where we keep vigil for one another, when we give one another the gift of being present to those among us who have had some special milestone in their personal lives this past week, or some particular joy or sorrow that they would like to share. And today, Tori Pritchard shares that she has a play next Tuesday. And Barbara Coldiron shares the simple joy of enjoying life today. I know that we also have concerns and sorrows on our hearts as we hear about legislation that is being passed around the country, especially what just passed in Tennessee. I know that it is heavy for many of us, the awareness, perhaps new awareness of when it is that we are crossing borders, not to another country, but merely to another state, and knowing that our rights may change simply by doing so. And so I only want us today to give witness to this and to re recommit ourselves to fighting it locally in our own state as hard as we can. Often what is heavy on our hearts are our own fears that we have fallen short. We know that we have left undone those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And we have the courage to be honest with ourselves, the willingness to make amends and the compassion to accept forgiveness from others and from ourselves, trusting in the assurance that imperfection is expected and love is the guiding and healing force with which we can align our lives. Yeah, right? They're really cool. They got fluffy tails. They were inquisitive. They live in the oak trees. I want to share a story with you today that happened yesterday or today or maybe tomorrow, maybe right now. So there was an oak tree, a mighty, mighty oak tree in the middle of an oak forest surrounded by pines, and there was a family of squirrels. There were mom and dad squirrels, there were parents, there were grandparents, there were great grandparents, there were nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters and cousins, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cousins. And they all lived in these trees and they loved to eat acorns and they loved to run up and down and circle around and jump from tree to tree, you know, and climb up. You ever seen a squirrel get right on the tippy tips of a branch and it sways and it goes back and forth, back and forth because the wind is blowing them and their weight. So one day the squirrels are there and they like to race and they like to eat their acorns and there's three squirrels laying around on the bottom. And there's a dark squirrel and a light gray squirrel and a gray, a silver squirrel. And they're talking and they're like, the best way to get to the top of the tree is straight up that trunk. And the gray squirrel said, no, 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 it's the crooked branch. You like to do the crooked branch. And the darker squirrel said, no, no, you just go straight up. So they're all arguing, and they're like, how do we get up the tree? And they all have different views of how they're going to get up that tree. And then everybody else is listening, and they're like, how, why don't you just have a race? 
And they're like, a race, yeah, let's have a race, because they had races all day long, every day, going up and down the trees. So they decided they'd have a race, and the great-grandmother squirrel, she took an acorn, and she said, when I drop this acorn, you'll race up the tree. And everybody, all the hundreds and hundreds of cousins and all the family were like, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. We're going to get to the top of the tree. And she dropped the acorn, and a funny thing happened. Some of the squirrels went in a corkscrew around and around and around up the tree. And some of them said, ah, I'm going to go to that pine tree, and I'm going to climb up that pine tree, and I'm going to jump across. And some of them said, oh, you know, it's pretty good here on the ground. I like it. I think I might stay here. Meanwhile, our two friends that were arguing over it, one went up the straight and one went up the crooked. And they both went, they were both heading up. Meanwhile, all the other squirrels were like, well, yeah, but there's a bird. And, oh, acorns. Let's go eat acorns. And so they were doing all their own thing, right? But the two kept going and going and going. And the sun started getting brighter and the leaves were getting breezier. And they get to the top about the same time. And they look at each other and they go, wow, it's pretty cool up here. Yep. Ah, Let's go back down and get an acorn. Okay. And down they go. Now, the cool thing is they all wanted to reach the top of the tree. But they all were searching for what was true for them. It kind of sounds like the fourth principle, doesn't it? They were in search of what was true for them. And they all went in all directions. But in the end, they all ended up where they needed to be and where they want it to be. And with that, I ask, where is your truth? How are you searching for your truth? And how are you developing your faith? And with that, our story is told. Until the next time. Would you please rise, either in body or in spirit, for hymn number 145, As Tranquil Streams. Our reading this morning is from Under Construction, Knowing and Transforming Our Unitarian Universalist Theological House by Dr. Rebecca Parker. Ever since Emerson said, why must we grope amidst the dry bones of the past? Why have a religion of theirs instead of a religion of ours? And ever since, in the Divinity School Address, he admonished his listeners, first of all, 
to go alone to refuse the good models and to dare to love God without mediator or veil. Our habit in liberal religion has been to emphasize that each person must build their own theology. Dick Gilbert's excellent adult curriculum, Building Your Own Theology, used in many of our UU congregations, reinforces the notion that speaking of ultimate things, theology, is something each person has a right and an obligation to do for themselves and to do so and to do from their own direct experience. This sensibility has great merit. It emphasizes the creativity, responsibility, and freedom that belong to each human being. It teaches that no creed, established system, or dominating culture should lord it over the individual's right of religious conscience. Often, in interpreting Unitarian Universalism to newcomers, this is what we emphasize above all else. This is all well and good, and I would not want us to lose this emphasis, but a counterbalancing emphasis is also needed because it leaves an important reality in the shadows. The important reality is this. When someone enters a Unitarian Universalism, they do not arrive at no place, they arrive at some place. They enter a house, a theological house, if you will, that already exists, that they did not build themselves. Unitarian Universalism has a theology. It is not my theology. It's the theology of a heritage, of a tradition, of a community. It's a theology that has evolved over time. So as you heard in the reading, in Unitarian Universalism, you're not just welcome to figure out what it is that you believe. You're not just encouraged. It's actually an expectation that you're going to do the hard work of engaging with questions of meaning and values and figure out what those things mean to you. And that being said, as the writer said, when you arrive in Unitarian Universalism, you are not arriving in no place, you're arriving in some place. This is not the tabla rasa, the blank slate of religion. Here, you are invited to engage with all the wisdom of all the world and also to learn more about this faith because we have over 2,000 years of history and theology that we can draw from, that we can honor, and that may inform what it is that you believe. So today, well, this month, we are going to be doing an overview of all of Unitarian Universalist history. Today, we are going to start with the Unitarians. And if we're going to start with the Unitarians, that means we got to go way back. We got to go all the way to the beginning of Christianity. Now, at first, they did not refer to it as Christianity. They didn't call themselves Christians. After Jesus died, they wanted to figure out how to live out 
this faith that he talked about. And so they called themselves followers of the way. And for a while, that was their main purpose, was figuring out how to live out these tenets that he had talked about. In time, though, people started questioning who was Jesus? What was Jesus? And there was not agreement on this because uh, Jesus didn't really make it clear. He didn't set out a creed. He didn't say anything about, you know, in fact, when he was asked, who are you? What did he say? Those of you who were raised Christian, anyone, anyone, I, who do you? Who do you say I am, right? All well and good, had disagreements, and then empire got involved. And whenever empire gets involved in religion, it's usually not going to be a good thing. Specifically, the emperor Constantine decided that Christianity should be the religion of the empire that he was working to build, but these pesky Christians kept having all of these, these fights. I mean, like some of these fights were, you know, coming out into the street. And so he decided that they, he needed to convene these church leaders and tell them that they needed to come up with some concrete answers. Who was right and who was wrong? So one of those leaders that came to the Council of Nicaea was Arius. And Arius, we can kind of consider him to be a, a pre-Unitarian. The big thing is he was hearing all of this stuff about a trinity, and it just didn't make sense to him. Those Trinitarians were trying to make sense out of a mystery and out of some political realities because they needed, in order to have authority, they needed Jesus to be a god and yet they couldn't be affiliated with the pagans um, and yet God was God and Jesus never said, I am God. In fact, Jesus said, I am the son of God. So they developed this idea of the Trinity to try and pull all of those different issues together. Arius said, I don't think that's logical. And specifically, he rested on the idea that there was a time when Jesus was not. Those of you who grew up in certain creedal Christian traditions um, probably know the other thing, right? That The idea that Jesus was eternal. And Arius said no. So at the Council of Nicaea, lots of debate, lots of fights, probably no surprise, but the bishop for Emperor Constantine won the day. They created the creed, and in doing so, Arianism was declared a heresy. Arius was banished, and they burned all of his writings. They didn't want that idea to get out because apparently we haven't learned anything in 2,000 years. Ideas are very dangerous things, and many people will try and get rid of them. And yet, for all that, ideas are much harder to destroy than books or even people. And especially with the idea of the Trinity. If the church had simply said, this is a metaphor for try to, trying to understand a mystery, there probably wouldn't have been any problem. But they doubled down on exactly what that meant. And every time someone tried to explain in some logical fashion what the Trinity meant. Like, did anyone here have, um, you know, a, a Sunday school teacher, let's call her Miss Martha, that, that explained the Trinity is an egg? That's one of the most common ones I've heard, right? You got the yolk and the white and the... Well, you need to go back to Miss Martha and tell her that she is a heretic because that is what, that is the heresy of modalism. Please don't actually do that. I really don't want... Okay. I don't, I, don't, I don't want 100, you know, Miss Martha's showing up at my door. They're scary. <laughs> anyway, so the ideas continued developing. The questions about tr the Trinity continued developing, but once something was declared a heresy, if you said it, then you often were put to death. So these conversations often happened very quietly. Plus, 
the whole tradition of the church at this time was that the priests were the conduit. So the priest would tell you what it was that you were to believe. All of that changed in 1436 with the invention of the printing press. I mean, think of this. Oh, let me also say the invention of the printing press in Western Europe, in China and, and in Korea, they, they had their own versions well before this. But in Western Europe, this was a complete game changer. The printing press was the invention of mass communication. Think of that. That was the invention of mass communication. And it meant, for our purposes, that they could print copies of the Bible. And now anyone who was literate could read the Bible for themselves, and they did. And many of them, searching and searching those scriptures, said, you've, you've, you've acted like Trinity is this really, really important thing, and yet that word is nowhere in here. And you've developed this very rigid doctrine of the Trinity, and yet that isn't in here either. And so you had these new Unitarians or non-Trinitarians who began talking about this and they began attracting followers. And, and it was, it, often it was in a very organic way because again, this was a very, once you read the scriptures, it was a very logical question. And so you had people in Germany, uh, Fausto Sozzini in Italy developed quite a, quite a big following We'll hear more about him. You had people like Sebastian Castellio who may not have been Unitarian themselves, but they believed in the idea of using reason and they believed that it was important for people to have freedom of belief and they advocated for that. And often, whenever they would advocate for that because the Inquisition was going on, right? they would lose their lives, or they would be imprisoned, or they would be exiled. So we had all of those happening in different areas. I can't spend too much time on it, but I will point out uh, Ferenc David, or Francis David, in Transylvania. We still, to this day, have Transylvanian Unitarian churches. You can go and visit them. And for a brief period of time, we actually had a Unitarian king, King John Sigismund. Out of all of these, what would often be martyrs, the most famous one was Miguel Cerveto, often translated to Michael Servetus. So let me tell you a little bit about him, because we Unitarians often consider him to be kind of like one of our patron saints, you know, a martyr of Unitarianism. He was quite probably um, a genius and a prodigy in many different areas, and one of those areas was theology. And again, he's studying the scriptures, and he comes to believe that this whole Trinity doctrine was a huge misstep in Christianity, completely wrong. And so at age 20, he writes a book called On the Errors of the Trinity. And then he sends a copy of his book to John Calvin. John Calvin was not, not impressed, not impressed. Uh, turned him in for heresy. So for a little over 20 years, Servetus went under an assumed name and lived a completely different life as a physician. In fact, he um, is credited as the first person to map out the pulmonary system. Like I said, this guy was clearly um, a genius in many ways. Common sense, perhaps not so much. Um, at a certain point, though, his, his deep belief that Christianity had really taken a wrong direction, became something that he could no longer ignore. And so he came back to this, and he started writing letters back and forth with Calvin. Um, Calvin was not persuaded by any of his arguments. At a certain point, Servetus writes a new book called Restoration of Christianity, seeking to take Christianity back before these errors were made, he also had some feelings about infant baptism. 
um, when his book, and, and his book was put out under a uh, pseudonym. However, Calvin, who had all these letters from over the years that he had received from Servetus, could recognize the arguments and turned him in once again to the Inquisition. And remember how I said Servetus was a genius, but common sense, maybe, maybe not so much, knowing that he had a bounty on his head. He was traveling and he decided to go through Geneva. Not just go through Geneva, but go to church that Sunday. Not just go to church, go to Calvin's church on Sunday where he was arrested and tried and martyred at the stake with his book bound to his side. Just like with Arius, they tried to destroy all the copies of his writings. And of that first book, On the Errors of the Trinity, there were three books that were hidden away, and they survived, and you can still read them to this day. The martyrdom of Servetus caught the attention of everyone in Europe. And it was really a, this was, this was where people really started talking about the importance of freedom of belief. And his ideas on Unitarianism, along with the ideas of these other kind of proto-Unitarians, would continue to influence others as the Reformation went on, including in Great Britain. It's very interesting kind of to look at how the development of Unitarianism as, as a thought um, springs up because for some it was transferred. For instance, I said Fausto Sozzini. Doesn't it, that sound like someone who would like being the Princess Bride? Right. Anyway, um, his, he was dynamic and his thoughts got brought by some of his followers into England. But then others, like John Biddle, it was simply a matter of, like with others, reading the Bible and feeling this idea of the Trinity is unscriptural. And at the same time, you have this growth of the idea of, of reason, even in religion, being something very important, and that freedom of belief, uh, freedom to exchange ideas, is also the importance, the value of that is rising. Now, poor John Biddle, um, at the time he was doing this, and this was dealing with the Church of England, he, got, he was in and out of prison just regularly because of his beliefs and because he was sharing these beliefs. But again, ideas are much harder to kill than books or people. And so these ideas of Unitarianism, both from those who had been followers of Sozini and also those who were coming to it on their own or through Biddle, kept growing. And in 1774, you had um, Theophilus Lindsay, who had been a, um, a priest in the Church of England, a minister. And he was hearing all of these things and developing his own beliefs. And he took the Book of Common Prayer, you know, from the Anglicans, and went through, and any reference to Jesus as God, he marked out, making it effectively a Unitarian Book of Common Prayer. And in 1774, he began the first explicitly Unitarian church there in London. Okay, I'm going to pause on England for a second and go over to what would become the United States, because Unitarianism in England and in the United States, it's not so much like many other denominations where it simply is brought over. There was a little bit of that, but more of it was something organic. And then Unitarianism in England and in the United States states somewhat had parallel developments and they would be influencing each other as more travel between the two occurred. So who came over to indigenous lands? Well, the pilgrims. The pilgrims, all those things you've heard about them, about them, first of all, let me be really clear. The pilgrims were not Unitarian. 
They were Calvinist, they were Trinitarian, but in their own way, they still believed that it was important for people to read the Bible for themselves. And so they really supported education and education for both b girls and boys. Now they were Calvinists. They did believe in this concept of the elect. So they did think that you would read the scripture and then you, if you were the elect, would come to the same uh, conclusion that they had. But nonetheless, this is part of who we are now. So these different congregations in 1648 developed this thing called the Cambridge Platform. This deals with ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the branch of theology that deals with how we run our churches and how our churches are in relationship with other churches. And in the Cambridge Platform, they agreed on certain things. Number one, congregational polity radical idea compared to Catholicism or the Church of England because what they said is there is no greater ecclesiastical authority than the local congregation. No bishop that's going to come into a church and say you're doing it wrong. They believed in covenant, in the promises that a community would make to each other and the promises that they would make to other congregations. They believed in having teaching and preaching elders and also having ruling elders. Those of you who are members, whenever we have a congregational meeting, I don't, ever, I don't know if you've ever noticed, I am not up here on the chancel with the rest of the board. You know why? Because I am not a ruling elder. I am a preaching or teaching elder. Chris is a teaching elder. And occasionally when we get her up here, a preaching elder too. Part of this congregational polity, this power, was that churches would ordain their own ministers, choose their own ministers. And they felt that churches were autonomous but would also co coordinate with the others. So those of you who have been UU for a while, anything up here look familiar to you? All of it. That is not an accident. We have descended from this, and we still use this ecclesiology. That number up there, 6521, I wanted to remember. Out of the six, so there were 65 congregations that signed on to the Cambridge platform. All those, 1648. 21 are Unitarian Universalist congregations today. That's the connection. So we had. Unitarianism in the United States developed in two major ways, um, but the, the most of it came out of this. Out from the pilgrims, people became congregationalist, and from the congregationalist, as you'll see in just a second, we became Unitarian. But you also had that England had come after the pilgrims, right? England came over, established itself as a power, and so they brought with it the Church of England. So you also had what was originally Anglican churches, but then as things changed in the United States, they could no longer swear fealty to the king, so they became Episcopalian, right? And so out of that also came some of the Unitarian churches. So King's Chapel, which was originally Anglican, they are hearing all of these ideas that are getting stirred up. They're hearing some of them from England. They're hearing some of them from the Congregationalist. And so remember Theophilus Lindsay, the, the British guy who went through and struck out things in the Book of Common Prayer. So there was a lay person going to King's Chapel named James Freeman. And he, inspired by that, did the same thing with their prayer book. And so around 1785 and 1787, they accepted that as their official prayer book, and then they called him to be their minister, making this the first Unitarian church in the United States. It is in Boston, and you can still go and visit it. It still looks pretty much like this. A friend of mine was the minister there. Ask me sometime about that. Boy, do I have stories. Okay, so... Unitarian, remember, so back over on the Puritan, the Congregationalist side, they are not calling themselves Unitarians. They are all Congregationalist, but there are different ideas that are coming out, and so some of these people are conservative Congregationalists, and some are liberal Congregationalists. The conservative or 
orthodox congregationalists do not like the things that the liberals are talking about. Boy, things have really changed. And so, as a slur, they start calling them Unitarians. By the way, Aryan, like for 2,000 years, has always been a slur. You will still find people who will try and put you down by calling you an Aryan. Anyway, so, William Ellery Channing, encouraged by other liberal ministers, delivers a sermon called Unitarian Christianity in 1819, where he effectively says, fine, we're Unitarians, and here is what that means. Anti-Trinitarianism was part of it, but it wasn't even the most significant part. It also dealt with issues of denying original sin, um, universal salvation, and most importantly, the right and the responsibility to use reason when considering religion. Then in 1825, May 26, 1825, the American Unitarian Association was created, and this, is, this puts a little chill down my back. Um, on the exact same date, this is, this is before telegrams, this is before email, right? Completely coincidentally, on the same date, the British and Foreign Unitarian Association was formed. Exact same date. Yeah. I like those coincidences. Okay, so the Unitarians in New England here continued developing. And the thing about Unitarians is if you insist that freedom of belief is core to who you are, people are going to come along and they are going to believe in that too. And their ideas are not always going to match yours. And that definitely happened with the Transcendentalists. So these people were primarily Unitarians. Uh, people like Theodore Parker, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Alcotts, the Peabody si sisters, um, and they were meeting to discuss the idea of breaking free intellectually from what Emer Emerson called corpse-cold Unitarianism. They weren't looking to start a new denomination, but they wanted to transform it within itself. And they got a lot of pushback, but... They, they changed us, and they, their, inf, their effect is still with us today. Unitarianism continues developing, not just with new ideas, but also moving, you know, adding more and more congregations as people are moving west. And so they create the Western Unitarian conference and this was organizationally speaking separate from New England Unitarians and they often had different thoughts than those New Englanders. It has not changed at all. I will tell you Unitarian Universalism, I have, I have someone over here nodding, Unitarian Universalism in Texas even though we share many of the same values, it is a very different animal than the Unitarian Universalist churches in New England in many ways, in terms of culture. The Western Unitarian Conference, one of the big issues for them was expanding the idea of freedom of belief and expanding it even beyond Christianity. It had been a Christian um, denomination up until this point. And I'm really kind of amazed at the forward thinkingness of this because at this time, all the Unitarian ministers were, if not Christian, they were at least theist. And yet they passed this thing called Things Commonly Believed Among Us, where they encouraged people to go to all scriptures, including world scriptures, and embracing that for the wisdom they could find there, and they changed a rule about who got to be a Unitarian minister, explicitly saying that not only did you not have to be a Christian, you did not have to be a theist in 1852, pretty big. And that paved the way for John Dietrich. So Don, John Dietrich is considered to be the father of religious humanism. He was developing, along with others, the idea of a religion that did not require a belief in a deity. And in 1934, he wrote a pamphlet for the American Unitarian Association called Humanism. And in it, he wrote this. 
If we live in a great impersonal universe with no friend to guide, it matters tremendously how we conduct ourselves, for we are actually the makers of human destiny. Our responsibility is to put beauty in the place of ugliness, good in the place of evil, laughter in the place of tears, to dispel error with knowledge, hatred with love, displace strife and contention with peace and cooperation. Naturalistic humanism, he concluded, brought to him a feeling of bliss. Sit with that for a second. All these stereotypes that people have shared with you over your life about atheists, right? Dry, re only reason-based atheist, and he writes, a feeling of bliss, and with it the intense longing that I may so live that posterity may have this feeling more fully and more often in the better world we ourselves must build. In 1933, the Humanist Manifesto would be signed with many uh, Unitarians, one Universalist signing it, and it changed our, it changed Unitarianism because it really opened it up to all that could be explored. And it opened up the idea that ultimately you are the person to decide what ultimate reality means for you. In 1939, one thing I haven't touched on um, this as I'm trying to stream through two th you know, nearly 2,000 years, one thing I haven't really talked on is the fact that for Unitarians, working to make a better world was always part and part of the mission of this faith, whether it was working for suffrage, uh, working against slavery. And in 1939, Unitarians were hearing what was happening in Europe and they knew that they needed to get involved. And so the Reverend Waits Still Sharp and his wife Martha Sharp went over, set up an office. They began doing things like setting up places for refugees, setting up hospitals, places for orphans, and most importantly, helping people escape the Holocaust. And when they, uh, a year later, 1940, they created the Unitarian Service Committee, which still exists today. It's now the UU Service Committee. And that is when the chalice became the symbol for Unitarianism. Last thing, the fellowship movement. So the Church of the Larger Fellowship, which at that time was a Unitarian church by mail for people who lived too far away from a Unitarian church. It had already been established. It was sending out materials. And so the main office of the Unitarians kept hearing from people saying, I want a church, but I know there's not enough people in my town to do that. And so you had people who went out, um, especially this one, Monroe Husbands, um, who would go out to different cities. They would run articles in the paper saying, okay, I'm going to be at this hotel. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Unitarianism is. And then they would help people start fellowships. Um, these were without ministers. They would give them all of the necessary information so that they could continue having their gatherings. And it is what grew this faith. I believe it was like by 1958, I think there was like 323 fellowships created. And many of the UU churches that you know now, not us, we came along later, um, were developed out of this fellowship model. And I am going to stop right there because the next thing that happens is merger. Next week, Universalism 101. I invite you now, if you're feeling as out of breath as I am with that, to take a deep breath and let's, uh, I invite you to join me in a time of reflection in word and in silence. Make yourself a little bit more comfortable. Close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that so that you can go more inward. 
These words are by the Reverend Kathleen McTeague. This is They Are With Us Still. In the struggles we choose for ourselves, in the ways we move forward in our lives and bring our world forward with us, it is right to remember the names of those who gave us strength in this choice of living. It is right to name the power of hard lives well lived. We share a history with those lives. We belong to the same motion. They too were strengthened by what had gone before. They too were drawn on by the vision of what might come to be. Those who lived before us, who struggled for justice and suffered injustice before us, have not melted into the dust and have not disappeared. They are with us still. The lives they lived hold us steady. Their words remind us and call us back to ourselves. Their courage and love evoke our own. We, the living, carry them with us. We are their voices, their hands, and their hearts. We take them with us, and with them choose the deeper path of living. And let's hold that for a moment in sacred stillness. Amen and blessed be. We are the position of the Free Church. Our church and our community outreach are supported not from an outside source, but from within. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and our institutional well being. We share what is offered every week with an organization that upholds our Unitarian Universalist values. This month, we are helping to empower the dream of Hill Country Community Ministries. Live Oak has long been a partner helping HCCM fulfill their vision to change lives in our community by eliminating hunger and creating pathways to self-reliance through community partnerships. Our church is one of nine locations participating in Fresh Food for All, where one morning each month, some of our members share the gift of their time to distribute free food to our neighbors from our parking lot. Share the Plate gives the rest of us the opportunity to share our financial gifts to support this worthy ministry.
Good morning again. My name is Chris Jarman, and I am the Director of Lifespan and Faith Development here at Live Oak. And as your director, I'd like to invite you to our faith development after our service today. Our number one thing today is we are doing a postcard blitz. You will find baskets in the sanctuary where we can live our faith out loud. I'm thinking about what Reverend Joanna just shared with us about the Unitarians and the service community uh, committee and how we are called to live our faith and to do good in the world. We are doing postcards for anti-LGBTQ trans legislation, and this is your chance to fill out postcards where we will be blitzing the legislatures, le legislators on Monday the 13th. I encourage you to fill out postcards to take them to your neighbors, take them to your friends, and bring them back. We'll be collecting them through next Sunday. And the teens will be out there helping. Um, instead of being in the library today, they will be in the fellowship hall getting you anything you need in order to make that happen. So our younger folks today, if our parents, if you'll sign your kids in at the faith development table, we have our OWL classes and our faith development class with Nancy Sheehy and Lee Collins this morning, and of course we have our parents as sexual educators course going on in room 105. So there are plenty of ways for you to engage this morning, and we invite you to stay in fellowship and live your faith out loud. Thank you. And now would you please rise as you are willing and able for our closing hymn, We Would Be One. When you become a Unitarian Universalist, these people that I have talked about become your theological ancestors, brilliant people who have changed the world with their actions. And yet, at the same time, you still have to do things in a church. You have to make the coffee and build the church and add an elevator. A, a task that has been coming for a very, very long time 
Today, we have passed all of the inspections. We can now live out our values around accessibility in a more powerful way. I invite you immediately after this service to go to the far hall where our elevator is, where we will have a ribbon cutting and an official first ride, and then we will have some celebration in our fellowship hall. May you go forward this week pulling in all the joy that you can, spreading love extravagantly, and knowing that even when times are difficult, life is still a gift. Let us say these words to each other. We extinguish this chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith, that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth. And now, as we depart, we extend and receive the gift of hospitality by taking the first five minutes to talk to someone whom we don't yet know well. May we all know the blessings of friendship and community. <laughs> 